Hey, 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 Closet Busters, come on and gather around. It's time once again to kick down those closet doors of life. We're here to escape our BS, explore our fears, and elevate our self-expression. I'm your host, Rick Clemens, Bold Move Expert and Coming Out Coach, and I'm going to take you to the party, the pulpit, the wake, and back to the party of living your life uncloseted. So come on, grab hold of yourself and get ready to step out, step up, and step in to living your truth as we explore more stories, tips, and tricks for living your life uncloseted. Now let's get to the show. So we all make plans. In fact, I had planned to do this interview a year ago, and then things kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed. And then suddenly something else happened, and before I know it, it's almost a year later. But plans, 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 whether you want to be a water polo player, go to law school, it's all about the plans. And then one day you realize, um, these fucking plans, they ain't happening quite the way I thought. But then you sashay in one day and you're a high-powered DA in L.A. and everything is going well and the plan is working, but the plan isn't making you happy. In fact, your dream job is actually the thing that's causing you the most angst in your life. And then one day when you're laying in bed after a couple of back surgeries, you realize, you know what? This shit, this don't fly no more. And that's why I want to introduce you to a gal that I had the privilege of meeting almost a year ago when she did her TEDx at Cal State Long Beach in California. And I was blown away. First of all, she was just fab and she was dressed fab. And I'm like, okay, I need to get to know this girl. And then I reached out and said, you know what? I think you should be on my podcast and we're finally making it happen. So welcome to the show, Emily Baker. I'm so excited to finally have you here, girlfriend. I am so excited to be here, and I'm so glad you reached out. I'm so glad you loved my TED Talk. Um, I got mixed feedback on my outfit. I felt fabulous. So I was like, I am wearing all of the sparkles, all of the bling, great shoes. As you should. As you should. We should (laughs) all be who we're meant to be. That's the thing. So, uh, But yeah, your TED Talk was great. I love the stories. We'll go into that somewhat here because I think we got to kind of set this up where you have literally, as I said in the intro, it's been a lot about planning for you. Yeah. And then the plans just, well, you did. You literally said, this ain't working any longer, you know? So take us a little bit through that journey of how you got to this space of plans, 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 and they just don't matter. So I think, I mean, to be completely, we're just going to get, we're going to get real people. So like y'all are my best friends. It's just us. We're just going to chat. I I think, and I've had a lot of time to reflect on this in, in the years that have come and I'm getting ready to turn 40 and I'm so much happier in myself now that I can Mm -hmm. actually honestly look back at what this is. You know what? My forties were my best. I love it. It's great. It's great. Now fifties ain't bad either, but forties, man, I kicked ass in my forties. So anyway, (laughs) back to you, back to you girl. No, no big moves at at 40, but it just took that long to get really comfortable in my own Mm -hmm. skin. Um, I think for me, it was all about the, the push between wanting to fit in and wanting to be accepted and then being who I was. And I was constantly fighting back and forth with wanting to fit in and be accepted and then being who I was. So by Mm -hmm. the time I got to junior high, I got picked on a ton. The bullying was not, um, I can't imagine what it would have been like now with social media, but the bullying in junior high almost ended me. It was, Mm -hmm. it was horrible and I couldn't see a way out of it. And I started getting more into sports and hanging out more with my guy friends because Mm -hmm. the girls that I was surrounded with were horrible bitches. And I had a core group of girlfriends, but they weren't picked on the same way I was. I, I developed early. I had a really big chest in junior high and it just, Mm -hmm. it became the point of everyone's uh, conversation and the girls all thought I was a whore and the boys all thought that they could just grab it because boobs were sticking yeah, out there so they I, are and let's let's play you know yeah like hey there's boobs there yeah, yeah. no you no you cannot right. um <laughs> so i had some really really tough experiences in junior high and didn't feel safe necessarily in my body um felt very outcast from my school group i i've always had a very low voice i got picked on for that um which is so funny because the people who troll me on youtube have the same comments that the people who were dicks to me in junior high have. Well, you know, as you were saying, have you that, all I talked? Was, <laughs> as you were saying that, I'm like, isn't this interesting that <clears throat> back in junior high, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a frog in my throat, but it, it's kind of choking me up that you said that because you you didn't feel safe in your body, and here we are in 2018, and this is the biggest conversation going right 
on right now in our world about how it women is. do not feel safe in anything, especially in their bodies, but in other areas too. So shit hasn't really changed much. Which is, it's, it's hard because I mean, I, I feel like I've changed, but even when I look back on it, honestly, and I really try to be honest with myself, I did not share my story, even with my closest girlfriends. I mean, the well, only reason not. my parents knew about some of the things that had happened was because in junior high, I got trapped into the, um, in we're going here, people. I'm sorry. Yeah. A little going bit of a trigger here. warning. It's not horrible, but just, this was, this was one of my most uncomfortable early experiences. Um, I got trapped into the cafeteria. I was putting away chairs after band because mm -hmm. I knew that band was the way I was going to fit in, but I didn't care. <laughs> so I played the drums when I was in band and I loved it. I loved being in band, but there were guys in there that were setting up the stage for something. Two guys my age who were much larger than I was. I still remember their names. Mm -hmm. One of them worked at my favorite Trader Joe's. I avoided it for two and a half years and I am an wow. adult and I could not go into J Trader Joe's and see that man's face. Um, but pinned me against a wall and started grabbing my chest and pulling at my shirt. And there were two of them. And I, I punched one of them in the face eventually and got out of the cafeteria and got in trouble for punching the kid in the face because their story was Emily punched us in the face. And nobody's like, it seems odd that you would punch a larger boy in the face in junior high. Um, so it took a while for me to give a, dialed down version of the events to my parents so I wouldn't get in trouble for for punching someone in the face and then I kind of realized that I liked punching people in the face <laughs> and um, decided to play water polo because there it actually go. it was a horrible experience it did make me feel very unsafe in my body but at that moment I got away and I was like okay we need to continue to get away so I played I started playing water polo with my <clears> club <throat> swim team and then joined the water polo team in high school which was an a men's water polo team. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, a but the thing is, is you got away. And I think I this is, this is so key crucial to people listening because we have people from all walks of life, whether it's yep. entrepreneurs, whether it's people coming out of the closet sexually, whether it's women who are like feeling they can't be safe, people in shitty relationships that listen to this podcast. The thing is, the key is to get away and realize you can get away from whatever it is. Is it going to be easy? Hell no. But to give yourself the permission to understand and believe that you can get away, I believe is a huge piece of the battle. Is to yes. Just, I'm going to get away somehow. And finding a way to feel safe again, mm -hmm. I think, is almost as hard and as critical as finding a way to get away. Well, yeah, because we're in a society at this point that says, oh, if you go get away in that way, there's so many people who are going to be detractors from that and say, yes. oh, you can't be that. Right. And as we keep evolving and, you know, I'm going to go to the LGBTQ roots as we keep evolving in our LGBTQ movement, society's slowly starting to catch up, but it's no different than what you just talked about with women. It's like, okay, women are finally coming out of the closet and saying enough is enough. Time is up. And it's because of those things that people know that on the other side of time is up is when you get away. Right. And I think sharing our stories helps other people go, oh my God, you know, I had an uncomfortable experience and I never thought of that as a traumatic experience. It wasn't until years later um, when I started gaining weight and started really having to evaluate where there was a disconnect in me that I started identifying all these past traumatic experiences because when you become a DA, you see trauma and you see mm -hmm. like the really, really bad trauma. And so my incident in junior high in my brain wasn't traumatic because it was just this thing and you know I wasn't violently raped and it was but that was the beginning of me feeling really unsafe in my body so it doesn't have to be this stereotypical or media driven image of what makes you feel unsafe anything that makes you feel unsafe and that could be uh, the color of your skin your sexual orientation your gender yeah. anything that makes you feel unsafe moving through the world is traumatic and i think now people are sharing their stories saying i'm dealing with this level of trauma on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. um and and we have to recognize the trauma in each other before we judge each other and that's been tough but it has been tough me too has let women start to share those stories mm -hmm. and and as other, hopefully as other communities and everyone shares their stories, we can recognize that our experiences, though different, are not that different from each other. No, I was actually out on a walk this morning thinking about my uncloseted movement and, 
and thinking about Instagram and things I'd like to put up. And I thought, you know what? I'd love to build a collage of just all the uncloseted things that are coming out. Me too. Black Lives Matter. Yeah. You know, all these things <clears throat> are perfect examples of people stepping forward to say, this does matter. Is it comfortable? Hell no. But when we enable one another to show this part of ourselves to the world, you know, and as you were talking and you talked about the stories, I wrote down a quick note here for, you know, my Motivation Mondays. It's like mm -hmm. the silent story. It's like the silent story is the, is, and I'm not sure how I'm going to finish it, but what I want to say is the silent story is the help not given. I think that's, right. that. actually, I think I just that's got it. it. No, so, write it down. That's yeah, it. Is the help not given, you know, <laughs> because when we don't speak, then we assume we're the only ones. I remember this when I came out of the closet. So I laugh so hard now because every day I see it so differently. But I thought, okay, I'm the only guy who was ever married to a woman who's coming out of the closet. And then literally like a month after I came out and started hanging out with some of my gay friends and going to the bars and stuff, I'm like, oh, holy shit, there's a whole, there's a whole tribe of us out here mm -hmm. who have done this, you know? And I think that's the thing. As you were talking about, you know, putting on the weight and everything, I'm like raising my hand right there because I went through the same thing as a young guy hiding his sexuality. Right. Get it behind my weight. And I mean, I think, I, I really think that a lot of us are ashamed of our trauma and ashamed of our feeling of, you know, aloneness. And I had a wonderful woman say to me at a conference I was recently at, look, you've got trauma. You're not special. Like we're all broken in our different ways. It's not, it's not special. It's not shameful. It's not even that different than everybody else's trauma. But when you don't speak it, and you don't share it, you can't have other people look at you and go, oh, no, me too. No, that was me too. And at a conference I was at, right as Me Too was breaking, I was at a table with women, and I said, have any of you had either an un unwanted sexual um, experience in your personal life or in your work life? Every single person had. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't surprised, because when women talk candidly, most have had um, some kind of unwanted uh, sexual conduct or workplace harassment mm -hmm. and then as we started getting into it people were like well you know he was my boyfriend at the time and even though I said no he still wanted to have sex but he was my boyfriend so that's and I'm like your body is mm -hmm. always yours exactly. no matter I mean when you're pregnant it's a little not yours and right. it feels very alien but other than that your body is always yours and it's yours to choose what you want to do with um, and and if you don't want to have sex with somebody, it doesn't matter if you're married or they're your boyfriend or you just met them that night, you get to say no. Mm -hmm. But you also get to say yes. So if you want to have sex with them, go for it. Right. Say yes and have that conversation. But if you want to say no, say no. But I think this is the power of being who we want to be, you know, and you know, my brand's all about bold moves and yeah. uncloseting. And, and to me, there's two simple words about both those things. Yes and no. You can say yes to the bold move, you can say no to it. You can say yes to coming out of the closet, you can say no to it. But when we start to see the power of yes and no, then that's when we get to do things. And I know in your work with entrepreneurs, you're starting to teach them the power of yes and no with how they show up online and the things that they need to kind of be watching for because everything doesn't revolve around, okay, let's go create the greatest online business and, and we just say the yes to everything. You've got to be really focused and driven by how you do that. So you have this moment or moments. <laughs> there's never just one. <laughs> there's never I mean, just one. There's never just one. It all kind of just continues. <laughs> we're sitting here. We're having moments right now. And <laughs> on. But you had risen to this great place. You were DA in the LA area. And literally, it just it wasn't working. Right. So I kept chasing achievement to feel like I mattered and to feel like I fit in. So first it was playing men's water polo. And that was like half me being rebellious and half me trying to take ownership back of like my badass side and saying, if you mess with me, I'm literally the girl that will punch you in the face at a bar and break your nose. Mm -hmm. um, and that became protecting for me. And that is, I think, how I got through college feeling rather safe in my body and protected because I knew that I had a tribe of women that also liked to punch people in the face. So yes. by the time I got to college, I surrounded myself by very aggressive kind of masculine energy to women. And I loved it. I felt very uh, safe and loved. And then I tore my rotator cuff while I was trying to punch somebody in the face. So mm. um, I learned very quickly <laughs> that injuries can kind of take you out and shift your course. Absolutely. And I transferred universities. I came home during that time. I actually met my husband and he saw all the mess of me rebuilding myself. 
um, because my identity had been water polo player. And I'm like, okay, I always kind of wanted to be a lawyer, but I never thought I was going to focus on school because I wanted to be an athlete and like athlete and playing video games and dating boys and going to class didn't all seem to work. So going to class kind of went to the bottom of the pile. So after I hurt myself, I'm like, all right, well, I'm not doing sports. I'm still playing a lot of video games. I'm dating just one boy. I can focus on my schoolwork. So I decided I wanted to go to law school and then it became a blinders on. This is the next achievement. Went to law school. Um, through my past experiences, I had a roommate who was uh, violently attacked when I was in college and that incident stayed with me. Her experiences after that incident stayed with me and I knew I wanted to be a DA. I knew I wanted to put myself on the side of victims to tell them it was okay whether they shared their story and prosecuted or didn't share their story, that they needed to know the outcomes and they needed to make an empowered choice so that even if they didn't share their story, they felt like it was a choice, not that they were being silenced. Mm -hmm. um, because I think when you choose to stay silent, if it is a choice to protect yourself and your soul, that's okay. As long as you don't feel silenced, as long as you feel that you're doing it to save yourself, I'm cool with it. So I became a DA, but then taking on all that trauma, and ha not having processed my own became very, very tough. Um, and after my second child, I was like, okay, I need to step back a little bit. I want to be around for my kids. Um, and I, my health was crap, probably because my diet was also crap. But my, I was suffering from adrenal fatigue. Um, I was out of work because I had mono, severe adrenal fatigue, and other gut-related stuff going on. And as I was bouncing back from that, I herniated my back working out. Yeah. And that's when I started the back surgery journey. So I had a year of just horrible health, my back laying in bed and my kids being like, mom, are you getting out of bed today? And I was like, this is not a life. Yeah. And the stress of work, I was not, there are people who are great at distancing the external stress and, the, and not the internal stress. I actually did my four tendencies quiz. <laughs> um, I am a full on obliger. I was going to so, say obliger, but I wanted to wait for yep, it. Yep. Full yep. obliger. So <laughs> I was, I, I could not help myself but to take on all this trauma and that was not a healthy work environment for me. There are so many fabulous district attorneys, a lot of upholders. There are so many fabulous, and some rebels, but there are so many fabulous yep. district attorneys. I know that somebody could step into my shoes and do my job better than me. And when you get to I'm Wait. curious real quick. So the, so for those of you who don't know what the four <laughs> tendencies are, do it immediately, do it immediately. Gretchen Rubin, go to, you can't miss it. She's a great gal. Um, love everything she does, but go do it. Cause you are going to be probably, you're either going to be like, yeah, that's me. Or you're going to be really surprised. I was, I know I'm an obliger, but so I'm me. also like on the cusp of rebel. So I'm, I'm right there. I'm right there with you. Uh, yeah. And, but the obliger always takes over, but it's amazing. The book is great. The four tendencies highly recommend it. Um, and what I love about this is when you can see these sort of things, then you can even move further through your life in so much more powerful ways. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, figure more than I mean I know people love their personality types but yeah. more than my personality type going through the four tendencies informed that I was not broken that I was not weak that I tend one way over another way and I need to build a life that supports that and that came after my TED talk I had kind of figured out that my life was not working for me mm -hmm. before and that's where my three words came from mm -hmm. but getting to see my um, my tendency really made a huge difference in the way I view myself, see myself and move forward through my own life. So go do it. Awesome. But yes, full yeah. obliger. So I took on all that stress. So when it was time to move, I had to, I had to kind of fight the obligerness in me because the mm -hmm. obliger in me was hearing my mother saying, well, what am I going to tell my friends that you do for a living? Exactly. And I'm like, international drug smuggler, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's really scary because you want to be that person. And this is so ironic because I just, I just had like a kick-ass, a real literal kick-ass meeting this morning with my mastermind group and they, and they pretty much put me to task. And um, I realized in the middle of that conversation, my obliger is still trying to play full out in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And when my obliger shows up, but does it the right way, then I actually can be the guy I know I am. I'm the funny guy. I'm relaxed. And I just, you know, I don't really, I'm free. 
it's not like I don't give a fuck, but kind of I don't, you know? Yeah. And I, I'm one of the few people that I feel like I can throw an F-bomb on a stage and people are just going to go, that's who he is. So it's not, a, <laughs> okay, that, there's the Rick, you know? Yeah. But the thing is, is I see it happening. And this morning it was happening. And I went out on a walk afterwards. And then I recorded a Facebook Live about the whole experience. And I'm like, this is what I got to do. I got to see my obliger in a positive way. So that I can then do the thing I'm really meant to be doing here on the planet. Let the obligers serve who they're supposed to serve, but not let it overtake me right. to where all I do is try to please everybody with how I serve. Right. That's the difference. And it's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard difference, but I feel you. I, I can totally, I can, I can drop an F-bomb. It was hard when I was in court sometimes to not drop, F, drop yeah, F-bombs. Yeah, I'm um, sure. It took a lot of work to not just curse all the time because <laughs> mm-hmm. I felt and, it. And, and for me too, but I know when I can actually pull it off and make it like there, there's the impact yeah. that gets dropped right then. And then we move on, you know? So you started to see all this, you discovered your three words. So I'm curious cause I alluded to it in the intro. What are those three words? So my three words are unique to me and, and I invite your audience to think about what their three words are going to be. But what I realized was that, I had never chosen a life path. I had always chosen a career path. I had never ever thought about where do I want a vacation or how much do I want a vacation or how many hours a day do I want to work? It seems like all those decisions are made. It's like get a job, work the hours they tell you, recover on the weekend, like take a week vacation, figure your shit out. Mm -hmm. Um, I had never thought that there were other ways to live but when I was off of work recovering from back surgery and like walking around playing Pokemon Go at 9 a.m. in the morning on the strand um I there were all these people out like who are these people out at 9 a.m. walking by Mm -hmm. the beach like drinking coffee and living their life tons of people not just like retired people all the people Mm -hmm. like there are, are people winning at life more than me right now who have found a way to make a living and live their life Mm-hmm. And it's probably because they chose a life first and then make money to support it instead of vice versa. So I want to make sure everybody just heard what she said. Choose a life first and then figure out a way to support it. And it's so backwards to how we are, are put into society. Yes. Completely backwards. Yes. We're trained to be employees. We're trained to just go pick a job from the time you're little kids. And I talked about this in my Ted talk and I constantly yell at people about this, but we ask little kids what they want to be when they grow up. And we expect them to say, you know, doctor, lawyer, scientist, we don't ask them, how do you want to be when you grow up? Do you want to travel? Do you want to play video games? Do you want to, you know, how do you want to live your life? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? We ask them, what do you want to be? Like, what job do you want to have? That is a shitty thing to do to our kids. Mm-hmm. What yeah. job do and you I, want? And I'm guilty of it too. I mean, as, uh, me as, too. as my daughter, my youngest daughter is in college this year and, and it's a struggle because I really know what she wants to be is she wants to be an outspoken feminist advocate. That's who she wants to be. So now we got to go wrap that in a, a wrapper of how she gets there without her feeling like literally fuck, I got to make it great. Right. You know? and, and not beat her up if she doesn't make that great. Right. Like, how does she then express herself? How does she show up in the world and still get to do that? You know, and it's been very, it's just been interesting being a parent and kind of doing this work because it's like you live, you do one thing and you want to be that with your kids, but you don't want to be the coach, but you want to also go, how can I bring this in? And it's such an interesting twist of how you show up in life as a parent when you do the kind of work we do. Absolutely. And what I hear for your daughter is that she has the opportunity to choose a degree that allows her to study the constructs of societies Mm -hmm. and how people work together and to start to speak change into that. And that's great. And at the end of the day, it's not going to matter what your grades are. Exactly. (laughs) No, it's about what you're going to, I mean, hello, uh, my degree is in nutrition and dietetics. I am doing the furthest from that. Well, I guess I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm giving people nutrition in a different way, but it's so <laughs> totally different, totally different. So, okay. So let's get back to those three, three words. words. Yeah. So I realized I needed to pick how I was going to be, and I needed kind of a mantra, if you will, of how I wanted to show up. And I came around to my words, which are shiny, sparkly, badass, because mm-hmm. it embraced, it's more of a declaration of this is who I am. 
And if the shiny and the sparkly or the badass offend you, you're probably not my people and that is okay. But if you have a little shiny sparkly badass, it is okay. And I have it pop up on my phone as an alarm four times a day because let's be real, sitting in my car and eating two like king size Twix bars are not shiny, shiny, nor sparkly, nor badass. <laughs> so it's, it's everything. It's like, am I showing up as the best, the version of myself that I want to be? Absolutely. And, and what does my shiny sparkly badass version of me do and not do? So when that version of you shows up, Emily, what's different? What's different? I'm me. Like when I can share myself without being afraid of judgment or ridicule, like if people want to judge and ridicule, it kind of rolls off because I know I'm, I'm standing authentically in who I am and that can't affect me anymore. It used to very much like other people's opinions matter. It is my new OPP. Like mm -hmm. other people's perceptions of me no longer matter. Um, I want to show up and serve the people who connect with me. And if I'm doing that, I don't really care what anybody else thinks. I strive not to hurt anyone, not to offend anyone. But if you come at me, I will cut you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and the thing is, is other people's perceptions, that's all they are is a perception. Right. Until somebody actually tells you what they think of you, you it's just a perception. Now, then when they do come and tell you what they think of you, you get to choose whether you're going to let that shit bug you or not. Right. You don't have to own it. You don't have to embrace it. You don't have to take it on. And again, I know I, I'm, I'm sitting here kind of feeling a little bit of a fraud starting to show up because I'm like, okay, I'm saying these words, but then, you know, an hour and a half ago, I was like, but what will other people think? Well, you know, this is what we are as humans, but the more we can step through that and realize it, then that's when we make the huge strides in life. We're going to do this from time to time. It's never perfect. No. It's just realizing when it shows up yes. and being able to say, oh, this is showing up. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it is Why interesting. Yes. And, and being able to acknowledge and let it show up because it's going to show up. Mm -hmm. um, but being able to acknowledge it, I don't, I don't walk around through the world all the time not concerned about other people's opinions. I mean, my mm -hmm. girlfriends, we had a, a little mom's night out and they picked a, a trendier younger bar and I walked in I was like why are we here I don't want to be here these are I don't I am not a bar person we ended up having a blast and having a great night and I checked myself I was like we're here to have fun um and did but it still shows up so everyone it's gonna show up but I'm gonna take what you, that story you just told and I'm gonna lay overlay your three words you were badass because you showed up in a place that didn't make you feel comfortable. You were probably sparkly to the hilt and you were shining <laughs> in your best way of just being you and go, okay, I'm going to get past this. So yeah. it's so interesting. And you know, my three words kind of shift, but just this year, um, the three that showed up actually probably are the closest to what is the essence of me. And it's fun, free and relaxed because yes. when I'm in that space, man, nothing, nothing can get to me. When I'm having fun, when I'm doing what I want to do, when I'm free to be the kind of guy I want to be, say the things I want to say, I am completely relaxed and I get to get off my freaking antidepressant. So there we go. I'm being really honest here, you know? <laughs> yes. But the thing is, is I have to let myself be in that. And sometimes it's literally, I have to give myself permission to go, okay, go have some fun, Rick. Go be free. Go re relax. But the minute you do it, your real self shows the fuck up. Yes. And you said that this morning. You said earlier, mm -hmm. when you when you show up in your obligeriness the right way, yep, yep. you are relaxed and you're you. Yes. And those are your three words showing when up. I oblige myself to be fun, yes. free, and relaxed. Yep. And I help other people do the same damn thing. Yes. And that's the same way with your three. That's what I loved about it. When I sat there listening to you, first of all, I'm like, okay, yeah, she's sparkling because she's got this great <laughs> necklace on, all black. She's rocking it. And I thought, this gal is speaking her freaking truth. She's being a badass on stage, and she's doing what she's got to do. And she's the essence of what I want to bring to this conversation that I, I'm so fucking blessed to get to do. I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, first of all, I get to sit in a wine closet every time I record. So who, <laughs> who wouldn't want that, right? And, and if the guest is really bad, then I just pop a cork and go, okay, fine, let's drink to it, right? But um, it, it's one of those things that, I wish more people would step into these spaces in their life. It's hard though. And I'm going to tell you guys, this is a secret. This is a friend's secret. No, literally one person knows this story. You guys, if you know my mother, 
do not tell her that I told this story on a podcast because she will absolutely die and be mortified. Mm -hmm. But um, after the years of health stuff and back surgeries, so I had a rotator cuff, an ACL, uh, Mm -hmm. two C-sections, and then the two back surgeries. Like I've done been it. But my weight is not where I wanted it to be. Uh, Still not. Still something we work on. We love ourselves. We move forward in imperfection. It's fine. I just want to feel like a healthier version of me. Two years out of back surgery, I can do that. But the TED Talk came up at a time where I was not comfortable with my weight. Um, And I almost turned it down. And I, I sat there and I'm like... I want to talk about being authentically you and I'm going to not go because I'm worried about the size of my ass. I'm like, are you joking me? That's ridiculous. I'm like, Emily, you're ridiculous. Stop it. So I was like, I'm going to embrace myself and share who I am. It doesn't matter what part of the journey I'm at. The people who, who will take away from my story will take away Mm -hmm. because it's about being you now. It's not about waiting till you're 15 pounds lighter to love yourself. It's about be loving who you are now and choosing who you want to show up to be. But my mother, when I told her I got the Ted talk, asked me if I had considered gastric sleeve surgery. Yes. And I was like, mom, you're asking me if I've considered weight loss surgery, knowing everything that this body has gone through. Why? And she goes, I just, and I'm like, does it make you uncomfortable that I'm going to do a Ted talk? That's Mm -hmm. going to be that your friends are going to see. And I'm at this weight. And she didn't answer me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, she's, my mother is embarrassed of my weight. I get it. Mm-hmm. but it, it is what it is. That's right. not my issue. And the obliger could have stood up to that and gone right into that space. The obliger who doesn't oblige yep. in the right way could have said, okay, I guess I need to go take care of this. Right. You know? And that wouldn't be authentic to me either. No. So it, but it was hard. I mean, it, it's not all it, stepping into truly living who you are every day takes decisions, which is mm-hmm. why I set the alarm on my phone that pops up four times a day and says shiny, sparkly, badass. Cause I choose to be the best version of myself. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I fall out of it and get sidetracked. But you know, it's funny that, that choice. It, it's very interesting that you brought this up. I don't think you and I, okay. So I'm going to be real honest here. Emily and I got talked. so real. You I know it got so real because here's the deal. Emily and I <laughs> spoke for a few minutes almost a year ago. And then we like, yeah, yeah. I want to be on the podcast. And then we shot a couple of emails back and forth. Then we became, you know, like most of us do, we become Facebook friends, we become Instagram yep. friends. And that's really all the conversation we've ever had. So I know you don't really know this story. So I literally had done my TEDx like eh, about three, let's see, you did April. So it was, it was about six months prior to yours hopped on a plane, flew all the way to Tokyo to do this sucker. And one of my things that I know that makes me inauthentic or when I know I'm being unauthentic is I sweat like a pig. And so I get to, te- you know, I get there every, i worked really hard. I had a week to put it together. I mean, I oh. knew what I was going to talk about, but they had somebody drop out and they're like, my TEDx coach said, man, if you want to come to Tokyo, you know, you're dying. But I'm like, well, who wouldn't, I will do this. Right. That's amazing. So I went and I thought, okay, I know I'm going to sweat because just, that's just what I do. So I had my little handkerchiefs and my, my helper who was helping me get ready to go on stage. I had my shirt completely unbuttoned. I'm like wiping the sweat and all this stuff. And then I put my handkerchiefs in my pockets. And then I got out there. And of course, as soon as I got going and I was doing my thing and it's not my best performance, but the thing that made it the most authentic was when I said, and sometimes you just sweat like a pig and I pulled the handkerchiefs out and I wiped my brow in the middle of it, not scripted. And that's when I quit sweating because yeah. that was the moment I allowed myself to step truly into my authentic self and just let the rest of the thing go. And I think this is one of those moments where you go, whether it's gastric bypass surgery, avoiding it or letting yourself sweat this is when you truly show up to yeah. be your best self. Absolutely best self. So now here you are, you're doing great things in the world. You're working with entrepreneurs, helping them do exactly what let's give that, because I think that's a whole nother uncloseted story right there. How you're yeah, I do. I do a couple things, but I, so I left the DA's office um, over a year ago now mm-hmm. and was thinking I was going to set law aside, but I really, having the option to set it aside, I realized that it was a part of me that I liked. I just didn't like the way I was practicing it. Mm -hmm. So I do legal consulting for online business owners. Um, I love working in the online space. And what I find is that a lot of online business owners 
start a small online business and don't think about setting up all necessarily the legalities of it because they're like, well, we're just going to make a couple thousand here or a couple thousand there. And then a couple years later, they're like, oh, this is my full-time business. I should probably make sure I am protected. My family's yeah. protected. Yeah. I've done the things I need to do. So I do a get legal business blueprint um, for people that starts with like a 30 minute call. And I've got a couple tiers of that, but I really wanted to make legal consulting accessible to entrepreneurs because most entrepreneurs don't have $5,000 to drop on a lawyer. And yep. if you do have $5,000 to drop on a lawyer, you've probably already set up all your business shit and you don't need me. So for really starting out businesses and then scaling businesses, I also do some other types of legal consulting, mm -hmm. um, and I started Ask a Lawyer Now, which is a service that allows people to have either a 15 or 30 minute call with a lawyer and just get their questions answered. Because awesome. I, I really feel that people cannot make an empowered decision about how to handle a, a legal situation or even a mm -hmm. legal adjacent mm -hmm. situation without the information. But lawyers charge for their time. I get it. Our time is valuable. Yep. But people still need access to real advice that's not them reading something on Google. Yes. Yep. I so, get it. It's awesome. Yep. And she's a butter consumer in a big way, too. You didn't bring that piece up. <laughs> <laughs> so much butter. My, so uh, much. my phone case right now says coffee and, and butter. butter. So she's um, actually a certified Bulletproof coach, uh, Bulletproof Coffee, if you've never heard of it. But um, definitely is something that, well, there's only 80, what, 80? There, when I became a Bulletproof coach, I was one of the first 80 in the world. Wow. Um, there have since been more that have certified. There aren't a ton of us. I love the biohacker nerdiness. Mm -hmm. but doing that coaching certification it broadened my worldview because I met people from every walk of life who were all striving to make the world a little bit better in their own way. Um, and a lot of it through really cool biohacking stuff. And these are your people who are jumping into frozen lakes and doing cryotherapy and doing light therapy and tracking everything and like testing their urine for ketones. Like I love my biohacker people, but just starting to find other tribes as I was getting ready to leave my law tribe was really valuable to me and it opened my world and it's made me show up in my life better. Like the three world, my word before the three words was I'm a lawyer. And then it was like, I'm a lawyer and I'm a mom, but I felt like I was a crap mom because I spent all my time lawyering. So I didn't even identify fully with mom. So I'm like, I'm a lawyer and you can't leave a job. That's your identity. So when you shift your identity to you identifying with yourself, you can do whatever you want to do to make money. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting just because my, so my tribe that I just, you know, referred to earlier is my, my, you know, mastermind group. Yep. Actually, the guy who leads it is also my coach. I would consider him my coach. I don't, he's the only coach I really have that I pay. And um, he said, what do you stand for, Rick? And I remember the day he said, for, said that to me. I've had other people say that. I mean, hello, I'm a coach and I've been through many, many coaching <laughs> certifications. But it was just the way he said it. Maybe it's because he's a handsome Brit. I don't know. But it's just the way he said that to me. And I said, I stand for people living uncloseted lives. And when I think about what I do, how I show up in the world, that's what it's all about for me. I don't care what that is. If it's my kid living in a closet life by t going through college in a certain way, then that's what I want her to stand for. Yeah. But I think when you can get to that essence and, you know, your beautiful words of sparkly, um, what's the other, badass? Shiny, sparkly, shiny, badass. Shiny, sparkly, <laughs> badass shows that you're living your passion. Yep. It's the essence of who you are. And speaking of passions, we can't, we can't wind this interview up without talking about the one thing you you know, girl, some, there's just people who like, you know, I always get around some people like you that are like, okay, they're just at the right space. And you are actually going to be speaking about your passion and everything at? I'm going to be speaking at the first annual Passion Summit in Chicago. That's so so cool. the Passion Summit is going to be, it's so nice because I do a lot of entrepreneurial stuff and I love my entrepreneur people, but yep. the Passion Summit is not an entrepreneurial conference. It is for anyone who's looking to kind of live a more passion filled life. So this is more of a lifestyle community event than it is like a conference. Yeah. And I think getting in community with people from all walks of life who say, you know what, I want to show up as my best person. I want to live my passion. And 
I don't tell people you've got to quit your job because that might not be practical for you, but you can live your best life in a lot of ways. What it leads to might surprise you, but you can't like quit your job and create your life if you aren't already living in your passion. So I'm so glad you just said what you said because I think, okay, and I'm going to get a little on my soapbox here and I've get got, on. <laughs> I've got millennials <laughs> in there. my life, love them all, but I think we have hit this this block wall where the only way you can be successful and all this stuff is to quit your job and go do it. Not exactly true. No. And, and one of my good friends, Chris Gillibu, who does the World Domination Summit, his book, um, Side Hustle, talks all about this. You can do your side hustle. You can do what you want to do, but that doesn't mean you necessarily have to give up what's making your most of your living. Let the other thing start to blossom. Let it come into play. And honestly, if I had it to do all over again, I probably would have gone that route myself, but I got laid off. And so it was the perfect doorway. That was the closet door that opened for me. Of Okay, you can either go through the closet door again and go right back into doing something, being Mr. Marketing Branding Guy, or you can say, I'm done. Go right. figure it out. And I think this is the key of, you know, really, truly living your sparkly, shiny, badass life, or whether it's you're going to have a fun, relaxed life that is free like I want to, or living your life on closet and making bold moves is find what works for you and don't be the obliger in life. Right. You can show up as an authentic person at your Absolutely. job. And be authentic as you ramp up a side hustle. I really think you don't have to burn down your life. I think these are puzzle pieces and we live complex lives, but these are puzzle pieces to a life. You don't have to blow up your life to live a better life. And I I do, I agree with you. I think that's missing because I think people, you, some people use it as an excuse. It's like, well, I can't just quit my job, but you could be happier every day. You could be happier every day by not quitting your job and doing something that adds and fills in the spaces. And I deal with this all the time with my clients. It's like, okay, so if you stayed where you are, what's, what is making you happy about that? And then what's missing? It's the, what's missing that, okay, now let's go figure that out. Let's go find that. Let's bring that into play. What's missing could be, you finally say, I'm going to do a TEDx talk. Even if mom says you need gastric bypass surgery to do it, you're going to go do it because it makes you happy. Right. And, and it takes you someplace you needed to go. So, uh, okay. So we could go on all day, but Forever. <laughs> we could, and I'm so glad we've connected. I know we need to do more of this together somehow, some way we've got to figure out some ways for the Rick and Emily show to, yes, please. And just do some more of these great chats. Cause I love it. So I just could leave people with one last piece of advice about really just, you know, going for it, living their life on closet, being bold, being, you know, sparkly, shiny and badass. What would you love the listeners to hear from you before we sign off for today? I don't know if they need to hear it from me. I think your listeners need to hear it for themselves, but you get to choose your life. I'm giving you permission to choose your life. I give you permission to choose how you show up in life. Pick the words that are authentic to you that are your mantra and remind yourself that you can find a way to show up in your life like that today. Mm -hmm. You can show up how you want to show up today. Mm -hmm. Be you. We love you. I am here to support you. If you guys feel unsupported, message me. I am all up in my Instagram messenger all the time. Trust me. me. (laughs) She is all up in it, and I love it. I love what she posts, and um, you you truly want to connect with her. And We'll have every way for people to connect with and everything you do. We've got your website and all that stuff ready to go up on the show page. So um, I just – I'm so glad we did this today. It was just like totally rock on, sister, badass, and I can't wait to just see what comes from this. So thanks for being you and being who you're meant to be in the world. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. You, you have a great show and you provide so much hope. Mm. And that's what I love because you tell people, look, you can, you can pick a life Mm -hmm. that's authentically you. And that gives people hope. Even if they're not ready to jump in just yet, they know it's possible. All right, there you have it. Another episode of Life Uncloseted has come to an end, but that's okay. We're going to be back in just a couple of days sharing more stories, tips, tricks, and wisdom for helping you live your life uncloseted. And you know what? You can share it too. Just take a few moments if you like and if you believe in this podcast and share it with someone you know today. Share it from your phone. Go share it on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you are. Maybe even give us a rating review because you know what? It's all about the planet living their life uncloseted. 
I'm Rick Clements, host of the show and the guy who helps you make those big, bold moves. And I hope you never stop stepping out, stepping up, and stepping in to living your life uncloseted. Catch you real soon. Take care, everyone.